Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Nice. It sounds like it. You guys got some hubbub going on. I like that. You're fellowshipping. That's what Chelsea said. <laughs> you guys ready to worship? Yes. Let's stand. scripture reading for today because I'm so excited about what he's going to preach on today. So I'm going to let his text speak for all of us because uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. And hopefully listening to this worship set, I hope it ties, you'll realize how it ties into what he's going to preach on. So that's my excuse for not picking a reading today. That's, that's a good excuse, right? <laughs> Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for everything that you do for us. Lord, I, I'm just in awe on a continual basis for how you pour out your blessings upon us each and every day. Lord, as the scripture says, your mercies are new every single morning. And that is certainly true here this morning. We pray that you would, would reveal yourself to us in a new way today. Lord, even if we have walked with you our whole lives, we can still learn more about you. You can still touch our hearts in brand new ways. And we ask you to do that this morning. Help us, Lord, to experience worship fully and completely. We ask that uh, you would focus our attention, that you would empty our minds of any other thing except your presence today. And, and we pray, Lord, that you would take pleasure in, in the worship that you hear here today. And Lord, also that you would magnify that, that, that pleasure in worship in each of us. We pray that you would open our minds to your word today, to the possibilities that you, you do want to work in our lives. And Lord, we just pray that in whatever way you want today, you are unleashed in this service. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said.
strength is failing. The angels lean, and my time has come. Still, my soul will see your praise.
more. Take me by surprise 
swept overboard I hate it when I give in to all my fears and stop trusting in you Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start out in 2 Timothy chapter 1 this morning, and then we're going to hop over very quickly to Matthew chapter 8, if you want to go ahead and find those. Let's see if you remember the theme of this, this last couple weeks. What have we been talking about? Christ is... Oh my gosh. Let's try it again. Christ is able... Never in recent times have we needed the reassurance of those words more than we need them now. We live in turbulent times. Things that a century ago were isolated events now very quickly escalate into crises of global proportions. We have pandemics. We have terror attacks. We have missile attacks. We have outright war. And, and all of these things are indeed cause for concern. But I think that too often... For most people, concern can easily boil over into outright fear. And we live in a world where fear prevails. Whether it's fear of a disease like COVID-19 or fear of where the next terror attack is going to come or whether or not the economy is going to crash, we need that calm assurance that comes from our absolute fact and the faith in, in, in that the Lord is still able to work in our world. And he is. He is able to work even when we don't know from one day to the next what they're going to tell us about the pandemic. He is at work and he is able to move in this world even when unemployment soars and inflation booms. He is able to work even when the deficit goes through the roof and the future of the next three generations are mortgaged. He is able to work when the tensions between nations turn to hatred and violence, when wars and rumors of wars come about. He is able to work when we experience natural disasters, earthquakes, famines, rampant disease and floods, when there are race riots in the streets of our nation's cities, and even when it looks like our culture has already gone down in flames around us, turning away from any semblance of biblical morals and values, even then we can live with great confidence because he is able in the face of all of these things and more. The church has stood strong throughout the ages and it has confidently marched forward through them and overcome these kinds of circumstances because he is able. And we too can follow in their footsteps and we can march boldly forward without fear because he is able to make us not just survivors, but he is able to make us victors and more than victors, as Romans 8 told us that we studied last week. 
Among all of the tools that he gives us in our arsenal to fight against fear and live with confidence is, is this promise. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. My friends, we do not have to live in fear like those who do not have a God looking out for them. In good times and in bad, in times of poverty as well as in times of prosperity, God takes care of his people. Who are his people? Those who have called upon the name of Christ as their Savior, who follow them with, the, with their whole hearts. Guess what? You here in this building, you are his people. God is looking out for you. He is taking care of you. And, and, and the trust that comes with that conviction, that sure knowledge that he is there, that has been the bedrock of our Christian faith for millennia. And we understand that because of that, it is tested Ours is not a blind faith. It is tested, tried, and true. It has withstood every single challenge that has ever come against it, and it will continue to do so into the future. We know that his power has been unlimited in long ages past, since before the foundations of this world. And we know that God does not change his power. That means his power is still unlimited in our world today. And he is able and he is willing to do something about the mess in our world. We have a grave error in our thinking that has crept into our church in modern times. We have built up this false image of God as something for church on Sundays, but he's not for the rest of the time. We have created an artificial dividing line and says God belongs here, but he does not belong over there. And so we have, in our minds, we have divided the world into terms of, of sacred and secular, and we think that never these two should meet. And that seems all night, nice and neat and tidy, but friends, God is unimpressed with our dividing lines. God is not bound by man-made borders. He is not kept in check by legislation or judicial rulings. He refuses to be segregated away from society because somebody somewhere might be offended by his mere existence. He is God. He created this world. He still owns this world, and he belongs wherever in it he wants to be. Amen. You know, and when I was younger, I used to get kind of lippy with my parents. Go ahead, say amen really loud. They're back there on the back <laughs> row. And uh, when, whenever I'd get lippy with my parents, you know what my dad would say? Boy, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Well, he never did, but, you know, sometimes I wondered if that was going to happen. Don't you think that God is, is looking down on our idiotic dividing lines, saying, you can't come over here? And don't you think he's saying, I brought you into this world. He brought us into this world, and we continue in this world by his design and his grace. How dare we try to pigeonhole him away and say that he is not fit for consumption over here and we have to keep him behind closed doors over here. God certainly belongs in the church, but he also belongs on the public street corner. He belongs in the workplace. Dare I say he belongs in the classroom, in the halls of government, from the Oval Office to Capitol Hill to the judge's bench in the Supreme Court. Now, that, that's not a political statement. That's a simple recognition of the reality of this world. He is God. And he is able to be wherever he wants to be. And he is able to work however he wants to work, wherever he wants to work. And he belongs whether people like to admit that he belongs or not. You might not like to admit that the sky is blue, but that does not stop it from being blue. You might not like to admit that God is in charge, that he is able to do great and wondrous things in the world today, but that does not change the fact that it is true. 
And because of his overwhelming power, we can live with confidence instead of cower with fear. Because we know that he is everywhere and over everything. We can trust that he is taking care of things that concern us. And we know that there is coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in that day, everyone will at last recognize what we have known all along, that God is the creator of heaven and earth, and it all belongs to him. So God is not just for church buildings, safe, secure, clean, and sanitary, and useless, God is not scared of what lies outside of the doors of these, church, of these churches. God is not scared to see the mess that we have made out of this world. He, he is not scared to see the messy side of our own lives. Nor is he shy about getting involved in our lives and doing something about them. So, so we're going to look this morning at, at a few case studies. And, and we're going to see some of these messy cases Cases where life didn't go as planned. Cases that got messy and yet the Lord stepped in outside of the confines of any type of formal religious setting. And he stepped in and he met the people's messes with his power. In Matthew chapter 8, we're going to start out in verse 1. It says, when he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Right away, a man with leprosy came up and knelt before him saying, Lord if you are willing, you can make me clean. This man was a leper. Lepers were unclean. They were outcasts. Even touching a leper was, was unthinkable to most because surely, so the average Jew thought, if you so much as brushed up against someone who has leprosy, then you would be unclean yourself and God would have nothing to do with you until you went through a very long, convoluted, and, and just downright unpleasant cleansing ritual, only then would you be allowed to come back into fellowship. And, and they thought that just brushing up against a leper would cause them to enter into this unclean state. So, so they actually had regulations in place that if a leper somehow made his way into town for some reason, usually they weren't allowed into the villages and towns, that, that he would have to, to yell the whole time he was walking down the street. He would have to say, unclean! At the top of his voice so everyone would know he is a leper so they could avoid him. So this leper was most likely at the end of his rope. Life as he had known it was done. Because the moment he came down with this, this disease, his family would have cast him out. His community would have gotten rid of him. He was forced to live on the outskirts of society. He couldn't work. He couldn't associate with friends and family. He couldn't even walk down the street without being cursed and run off. What was left of his life was a mess. He brought that mess to Jesus and knelt before him. And I want you to notice something really interesting there in verse 2. The, the leper's words, it said, Lord, if you are willing. The leper did not say, Lord, if you are able, please do this. He said, if you are willing, please do this. And those are two completely different things. There was never any doubt that Jesus was able to heal him. Even by this point in his public ministry, Jesus has proved multiple times that sin is no obstacle to his power, that he could cleanse people uh, in any way that he chose. So, so there was no doubt in the leper's mind that, that Jesus could do this thing. So he comes and he questions his willingness to do this. This man has been so beaten down by society that he has no sense of self-worth left at all. He was convinced that he was no good and worthless because of his medical condition. He had the idea pounded into him that God wouldn't even want to look at him, let alone heal him. And so he doubted that even though Jesus had the power, he doubted that Jesus had the heart to do it. And I think that if we are honest, a lot of us find ourselves in exactly that position. We don't doubt that God can work in our lives. We just doubt that he wants 
to work in our lives. We doubt because we know that underneath this calm facade that we wear around in public, that underneath the smile that we plaster on our face when we set foot into the church, we know that we are all a mess. And we think, why would God want to work in my life when he can work in that nice person's life over there? And we have this inferiority complex of thinking that other people are better than we are, that God wants to give them attention and wants to give them miracles and them power in their lives. But he would never want to do something in such a messy life as mine. My friends, Jesus specializes in cleaning up messes. This man, this leper, was a big hot mess when he came to Jesus. It was his desperation that drove him to take a chance on Jesus' willingness to help him, even when he thought that he wouldn't. And he found that Jesus was not only able, that Jesus was indeed willing So Jesus had compassion for him. He wanted to help him. And he wasn't afraid to reach out and touch him. The first contact this leper has had with another human being in who knows how long. Look look in verse 3. It says, reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing. Be made clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I, I want you to understand this clearly. God is not afraid to sit in the messy trenches of life with you. He knows exactly how messy your life is. He knows how imperfect you are. But he is not afraid to reach into that mess and deal with it directly. He is not only able to help you in your hour of need. He is willing to help you if you call out to him. And I want you to understand that you might have come in here this morning with a load of emotional baggage. Perhaps you've been carrying that around for years. Maybe you've had bad experiences with the very people who should have been loving you. Maybe you've gone to a church and you have been found judged and wanting by supposedly Christian people. Maybe you have been so beat down by your family and friends, so-called, that you don't see anything worthy in yourself. Maybe you've made so many bad decisions that you feel like, well, yeah, God's going to bless them, but he's never going to bless me. You cannot even come close to the idea that God would want to do miracles in your life. But friends, you're wrong. Just as surely as those Pharisees were wrong in the New Testament when they told that God told the lepers that God didn't love them anymore. If you are sitting here this morning and you, you are not beyond his love or his reach, no matter what kind of mess your life is in, God wants to do something about it. He is not only able, he is willing. And he has already begun that process. Do you know that he went to the cross exactly to deal with messes like yours? And now because of that, he can give you a future and a hope. That right now you can call on him to forgive you, to save you for eternity, and to wipe your slate clean. Right now you can call on him to give you strength to overcome the obstacles maybe that you've thrown into your own life. And, and you can overcome them. And I've quoted this many times to you before. My favorite verse in the whole Bible, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. That means he is not holding it over your head. He is not going to throw it in your face. He is going to forgive you and forget it and never bring it up again. He is able to do that. And he gives us the power to forget it ourselves and move on. There are none of us here that that, that are perfect, are we? We have all been made clean by Jesus Christ. He has cleaned up all of our messes. And that's true for every single one of us. There's nobody here that's better than anyone else. It's time we start looking to Christ who is able to make a difference in our lives. Start following him Start living for him and see what he will do for us. I I was reading a a very fascinating novel. I I think it was a couple of years ago that I read this. It was called Hidden Empire by Orson Scott Card. It was just a a fantastic book. I I couldn't put it down. And and it was uh, 
kind of like reading today's headlines. It's kind of kind of weird. There, there was a, a virus that, that came out of Africa and, and all about the world's response to it and the political maneuverings behind that. And, and because of this, this virus in this book, they, they quarantined Africa. They wouldn't let anybody into it or out of it. And, and there were many Christian relief aid, uh, aid groups in the U.S. That, that demanded the right to go in and uh, bring relief to those that were suffering. And eventually, the government broke down and says, all right, you can go, but you can't leave until this thing is under control. It's either burned itself out or we found a cure. And uh, a couple of the characters, they, they were having a, an argument. It was a mother and a son. And the son says, it's our Christian duty to go and care for those who desperately need our help. And so um, during this argument, what caught my attention was that they quoted a, a history professor who talked about the response of medieval Christians to the plagues that had decimated Europe. Now, that kind of stuff fascinates me, so I, I tracked it down to see whether this was a real quote or whether it was just something the author had made up on the fly for the story, and I, I found out it really was a, a true quote. It wasn't a history professor, but it was a sociology professor. Uh, Rodney Stark, he wrote The Rise of Christianity, which is a fascinating read in and of itself, uh, and, and he, he posited in his book that the rise of Christianity was due in large part because of the difference in character of the Christians from their pagan counterparts. And, and that was very much illustrated whenever the plagues swept across Europe. When the plagues came, the pagans fled the cities. The Christians stayed and ministered to those who were sick and dying. Also in the Middle Ages, the, the Christian populations grew faster because Christians didn't practice abortion or infanticide as means of birth control. Christians did not fight against their oppressors. They turned the other cheek and they willingly went to the stake as martyrs, all the while singing the praises of their Lord and praying for those that were about to kill them. Men would become Christians and their neighbors would see that suddenly they treated their wives differently. That the wives were no longer useless property, but instead were unique gifts of God made in his image and valuable in their own right. And, and this professor said that Christianity triumphed because Christians acted like Christ. Isn't that a revolutionary concept? Christians acted like Christ. Do you know who made that possible? It was Christ himself who gave them the power to do these things that so set them apart from the other people in their world. He was able to do it then. He is able to do it now. Let's look at another messy case. Verse 5. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him. Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. He said to him, Am I to come and heal him? Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, Go, and he goes. And to another, Come, and he comes. And to my servant, Do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you that many will come from the east and west to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus told the centurion, Go, as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very moment. Now the leper had certainly been an outcast. But at least he was Jewish. But this, this centurion, he was an outsider. He was a Roman. He was a pagan. And that's even worse than a leper. Here was a man who was a big part of the cruel and systematic oppression of God's chosen people. Surely, they thought, God would not answer the prayers of such a man. But again... They were wrong. God cannot be contained by the boxes that we try to stuff him into. 
He reaches across the lines of tradition, religion, race, and politics. And he heard the prayer of this man. And in some ways, this centurion was a lot like the leper. He didn't doubt that Christ could do it. He was only unsure about whether Jesus would be willing to do it because of his own perceived unworthiness. He knew exactly what Jews thought of Romans. So why would a Jewish rabbi ever want to help a Roman centurion? It was a mark of his desperation that he even came and, and asked Jesus to intervene. And miraculously, Jesus did want to. Jesus is not bound by the boxes that other people try to put him in. Neither is he bound by the boxes that we build around ourselves. The Roman centurion could have come up with all kinds of excuses why Jesus would not intervene and convinced himself not to go. That's what we do. We come up with excuses. We come up with rationales for why God wouldn't want to work in our lives. So we don't even ever bother to ask him. Listen, friends, you've got to open yourself up to the possibility that he is not only able and willing to work in the other person's life, but that he is able and willing to work in yours. He sees us for who we are and he loves us anyway. He knows the messes in our lives and instead of condemning us for being a mess, he brings his power to bear and he lifts us out of it. And he will do that whenever and however he pleases. Do you know that there are places that God is on the move right now that you would never in a million years have expected it? Do you know where one of the fastest places that Christianity is growing on the face of the planet right now is? Anybody care to hazard a guess? Iran. Who would have thought that in the midst of oppression where you could literally lose your head for claiming the name of Christ. Who would ever have expected that there God could work and call people to himself? He is God. He is able. And he is willing. One more thing I want you to see in this chapter. That's in verse 23. And he got into the boat. His, dis his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a violent storm arose on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus kept sleeping. I think that's got to be my... I, I said Romans 8, 1, but maybe that's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Jesus took naps. Isn't that great? So that, that must mean I'm a lot like Jesus. So, verse 25. So the disciples came and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us! We're going to die! He said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. And you look at this and say, what has this example got to have to do with the other two? Well, sometimes we are responsible for making our own messes. Maybe a lot of times we are responsible for making our own messes. Sometimes, though, sometimes the messes come through no fault of our own. Sometimes they're not medical or social or familial. Sometimes they're completely external. And when, that, when they come, we find ourselves floundering, wondering, how could this have happened? What am I supposed to do now? Even asking ourselves, Lord, where are you? The Lord is able to do something about those messes also. It certainly wasn't the disciples' fault that the storm blew up when and how it did. And it must have been a really bad storm because several of these men were experienced sailors. They had, were fishermen for a living, and so they were out in the water a lot. For this to be bad enough to make them frightened, you know it had to be bad. And, and you know, I love how Jesus is just taking a nap through this whole thing. Uh, the, the disciples, though, they, they were getting concerned and then their concern spilled over and became worry. And their worry spilled over and became fear. And by the time they got around to waking Jesus up, fear had a grip on their hearts and they were convinced that all was lost. That they were all going to die. 
So, so they did the right thing coming to Jesus. But the wrong thing they did was waiting too long to come to Jesus. And they put themselves through a lot of unnecessary anguish because of their hesitancy to wake the Lord up. We should not be hesitant to bring the concerns of our heart to the Lord. We should not wait around thinking, well, it's not that bad. You know, I, I'm not like that person over there. They, they've got all this stuff going on. I, I can deal with this. And we deal with it and deal with it and deal with it until a little problem becomes a major problem. And then we're overwhelmed. Don't wait. Bring it to the Lord at the beginning. Save yourself the worry. Save yourself the fear. Save yourself the anguish. Bring it to the Lord early. Trust that he's going to do something about it. And then sit back and watch him work. And you know what happened when they came? They, they woke Jesus up. They came to the Lord. He woke up. He calmed the wind in the sea with a single word. And at the same time, he calmed the disciples. Wouldn't you rather be the disciples post-waking Jesus up instead of the disciples pre-waking Jesus up? And in that instant, he showed that he was not just Lord of spiritual things. He showed that he was not just Lord of internal processes like emotions or even internal processes in your body like disease. He showed in that moment, in that boat, that he was Lord over the physical processes of the world as well. The disciples called out to him in fear and he answered their desperate plea. He was able and he was willing to do something about their circumstances. I want you to consider these three events together. Christ was willing and able to work inside the confines of Israel with the leper. Christ was willing to work outside the traditional boundaries of faith with the centurion. Christ was willing and able to work in the world at large when he calmed the sea. There was nothing that was beyond his power. There was no place or no people that were immune to his touch or outside of his mercy. And that is still true. The disciples at the end of this verse 27, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? You and the winds and the sea obey him. Indeed, what kind of man is this? He is the Messiah. He is Christ, the son of the living God. He is the only one who is able to save you. The only one who is able to change you. The only one who is able to change your world. In him, we find the power to overcome. In him, we find the ability to hope. In him, we find the courage to follow. Christ is able. Do you believe it? Yes. Then let him clean up your messes. Let him change your attitude. Let him change your family, your community, and our world. He's ready. <coughs> Let's pray with me. Father, we bask in the glory of what you are able to do. We're overwhelmed that such an incredible God would care about the, the things that we are going through. But Lord, we trust that you are. And so this morning we would ask that you would help us to bring everything to you. Those things that we have been holding on to thinking, well, it's not that big of a deal. Help us, Lord, this morning to bring those things to you. Those things that have been overwhelming us. 
that we know that you could do something, we just haven't had the confidence to ask you because we didn't know if you wanted to. Lord, give us the confidence to come to you and lay those things at your feet and ask you to take care of them according to your wisdom. Lord, where we have been living in apprehension and fear and doubt, we pray that you would wipe that away and let the glorious truth Christ is able resound in its place. We ask you to do a work in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we do each Sunday, we open the altar before you if the Lord has touched your heart and you need to bring one of those messes to him. You're welcome to come and kneel here and do that. Uh, some of you can't kneel. If you want to sit right where you are and bring that mess to him, he's able to hear you right there as, as, as easily as he is up here. You come to him this morning trusting that he is able and he is willing to do something about your mess. And this morning, have the confidence to ask him to take it. You come this morning as he calls you. Would you please stand as we sing? For you deserve the glory and the honor. And as we lift our hands in worship, as we lift your holy name, for you deserve the glory. for just a moment. <clears throat> Got a couple of announcements for you before we close. Um, first off is Wednesday nights. Our uh, children's program is over for this year, so they will not be meeting during the summer. That means no meal on Wednesday nights. Do not come planning to eat because you're going to get hungry. Uh, and uh, we're going to be starting adult Bible study a little bit earlier since we don't have other activities going on. So we're going to be starting at 6 o'clock instead of 6.30. So you'll want to be here for that. We are, have started a study in 1 Corinthians that is really good. So you'll want to come and be a part of that. And that's at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights throughout the summer. Uh, June 7th, we are starting back up our lunch club. Uh, which has been on hiatus because of COVID for a year. Uh, that's where we all meet together once a month and we go out to eat somewhere. Uh, we're going to meet here at the church at 1030 on June the 7th. And uh, anybody that wants to ride the church bus, we're going to load up and we're going to go to the Hill in Springfield, which is an Italian buffet. That's fantastic. So uh, you'll, you'll want to come and be a part of that and uh, bring, your, bring your elastic pants because you're, you're going to need them. Uh, so we'll be doing that on June the 7th. Um, also, uh, uh, our, we're getting back to a regular schedule now on, on our normal church activities, and that includes business meetings. And so we're going to have our next regularly scheduled business meeting. It'll be a short one on uh, June the 6th, immediately after church services, so you'll want to be here for that. Um, Vacation Bible School is coming up quickly. That's going to be July 12th through the 15th. And right now it's looking like we are going to be doing that in the morning. We put a poll up on Facebook and asked people to vote on, on what they wanted to do. And, and uh, like 95% of people voted that they wanted to have it in the morning. So that's what we're looking and doing. If you'd like to help with that in any way, shape, or form, it's going to be Monday through Thursday. Uh, please see either myself or Ann, and uh, we will plug you in someplace. I know several of you have volunteered already, but we still need several more in order to make that happen. Uh, again, that's July 12th through the 15th. Uh, something new we're, we're going to be starting is a new prayer group. And Terry, do you want to say anything about that?
Yes. And if you can't be here, you can still pause wherever you are at 10 o'clock on Tuesday mornings and pray with us as well and, and join us that way. <coughs> All right. Anybody else have any announcements? Yes, Rod. I've got three things. All you've got to remember is June 6th. Got that? What did I say? June 6th. All right. What time? I didn't tell you yet. 9.30. You got that? Okay, here you're going to remember. I don't even have to remind you. Breakfast. Okay? The men's Bible study, Sunday morning Bible study class is going to put on a breakfast at 9.30. When? June 6th. There you go. And what are we going to do? Eat breakfast. We'll be here. Okay? That's it. Don't forget that. God is able. <laughs> Ms. Cheryl? Oh, no. uh, ladies, women's ministry, uh, really happy to announce that we're going to have an in-person Bible study again. Uh, Teresa Gates has volunteered to lead us in a Bible study. And on the Connect table is a, it's not a sign-up sheet yet, but it is a sheet to mark what you would like to study. And Teresa, bless her heart, she's got five different topics that she is willing to lead us, and we have to narrow it down to two. So on your way out, if you think you want to be a part of that Bible study, which will be on Wednesday mornings from 10 to 11.30, uh, mark off a couple that you think are something that you would need, enjoy, and, and want to study. And then we'll give Teresa however much time she needs to put it all together and, and get started. Yes. I just wanted to announce because it's been a long time, especially since on a Sunday that I've brought it up, if at all, is that uh, my brother is doing, he's slowly but surely doing better. I just wish it's the, the healing or I just wish that he would uh, improve a little bit faster. But I appreciate everyone that uh, has prayed or asked me specifically about it or just allowed me to talk with them briefly about it. I just want my appreciation to be known and may the Lord uh, work with uh, my brother on helping uh, him get better with his liver difficulties that he's having now. A date has not been set yet as to when he will actually have the transplant, but he will need one. Okay. We will continue to keep him in prayer. Okay. Any other announcements? Seeing none, would you please stand? And Dave McLaughlin, would you close us in prayer?